Welcome to the Not All Better Show Smithsonian Associates Series. I'm your host, Paul Vogelzang, and this is episode number 195. As part of our Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series, our guest today on the Not Old Better Show is Kevin Turvala. Kevin Turvala studies creativity in sub-Saharan Africa. Trained as an art and architectural historian, he is broadly interested in how environmental conditions shape creativity and artistic form. African art has always played a role in society that sort of extends beyond that of the beautiful, that of these this aesthetic object that we just drive appreciation for. It lives, it um, plays a function in society, it has a role to play in the world, and you see that not only in the art that's being produced around independence, but you see the independence era in 20th century Africa, but you see it sort of throughout all time periods and continent. That, of course, is our guest today, Kevin Tervila, who will be at the Smithsonian Associates program presenting African Art and the Struggle for Independence, April 9th, 2018. Please join me in welcoming to the Not Old Better Show via Skype, Kevin Tervila. Kevin Tervila, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it is a pleasure to talk to you. Tell us a little bit about African art and the role that it is played uh, in this kind of struggle for independence, the subject of your Smithsonian Associates presentation? So Africa really plays a central role, um, really art of all forms plays a central role in how these nations that were formerly colonized become sort of the states that we that we think of today. And, you know, when we think about this independence process, oftentimes what comes to mind are, you know, politicians and and rebel leaders and sort of these, the sort of, more violent and sort of political struggle um, that oftentimes comes when, you know, you're throwing off the yoke of colonial oppression. But what people sort of forget about this is that at the same time that this is happening, you need, there needs to, there are a lot of other things going on and artists are playing a huge role in not only mobilizing international support, um, but also really developing a visual language and a vision that a society that really hasn't existed before can sort of come to think of themselves as, you know, if you don't have, say, the country of Senegal, which never existed prior to, um, you know, prior to colonialism and didn't exist during colonialism, artists helped in that country helped really crystallize what Senegalese identity meant, which is just as key to sort of establishing what a nation is, establishing sort of that, that sense of we are all in this together. And so artists play a key role in that. And they also play a key role in sort of giving visual, sort of a visual representation to what's going on in the country for people outside of the country who may not know to sort of hang on to. So we're talking about photographers in this case. Um, we're also just talking about paintings that are, are sort of, um, really doing some work of their own and sort of saying, this is what this is what Senegalese identity is. This is what South African identity is. This is what Nigerian identity is. That, it, it is such an interesting subject, uh, Kevin Gervilla. I, I think that it, it really has this kind of point of intersection that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily have, have come to on my own, but tell us how specific, let's dive a little deeper and, and tell us how specifically the art and the politics are connected? You know, in other words, what do painters and sculptors have to do with politicians and soldiers? So, you know, painters and sculptors and photographers and I mean, people who are creating textiles, really any sort of visual, anything that you can look at, anyone who's creating something in the world that you can see um, are connected with politicians and soldiers, because really what it is that they're doing is they are giving a visual manifestation to the ideas that are circulating. And I think, you know, when we think about concepts like independence and nationhood, these these are very abstract things. I think we can we can certainly feel them, but I think it's oftentimes easier if we have something to sort of latch to sort of latch our 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 mind and our eyes onto. You know, when we think about, you know, the American Revolution, we think of these iconic paintings of George Washington crossing the Delaware river and when we think when we move that into an african context i think the subject the subject matter obviously changes um but you're having very similar things going on so for instance in uh the country of 
Senegal, which I've mentioned before, there's an entire class of tapestry artists, so weavers. There's an entire class of painters who are sort of listening to the ideas that um, these these politicians, these sort of nascent political movements that are sort of casting off, in this case, French colonialism, um, or listening to what these these sort of thought leaders are saying and listening to what these politicians are saying about we need to embrace our own African identity. We need to develop a way of expressing ourselves, not as sort of black French Africans, but as Africans first and foremost. And so they're listening to that and they're creating a visual language in which that sort of takes place and in which pe- that sort of crystallizes and visualizes that message. So you see, I mean, for instance, you, you see a complete rejection, you know, when we think about painting and we think about, we think of three dimensionality and we think of sort of this depth and this illusionistic representation. Um, and you really see in Senegal's case, you see, and in the case of a lot, several other sub-Saharan African countries, you see artists who are listening to these calls for a renewed African identity that sort of casts off and forgets about Europe and saying, we're going to forget about these things of illusionistic representation and and three dimensionality. And we're going to go with what we know, which is, and what is represented in our historic arts, which are these very um, flat, almost two dimensional um, representations of scenes. It's very geometric. It's very abstract. Um, All of these, all of these words that you think of when you think of traditional African art and um, you have, you have these artists who are really trying to channel these ideas into visual form. And then, so that's sort of when it, when you're dealing with how does a nation develop? How does this, how does sort of this national identity take shape? But then you also have artists who are actually, who are working as graphic designers, who are working as muralists, who are working, who are creating these sort of, uh, installation works, um, I, we, is what we would call them today, but basically these sort of sculptures in public places, these public, um, these sort of pop-up public arts that are really protesting what's going on um, under under colonial rule. So you see in South Africa and Mozambique, you see the emergence of sort of this, these resistance arts that are coming in these m- sort of mass distributed um, leaflets or murals, or, or as I said, these these sort of public art projects that sort of spring up and then quickly get demolished by the colonial state, but they exist long enough for people to look at them and see them and respond to them. Um, so you see artists both engaging sort of in that more political realm um, and in more of that sort of what we think of when we think of sort of revolutionary movements, that sort of on the ground, more militaristic style um, form of activism. Well, you you, you mentioned creativity and, and I want to shift gears and talk about that for just a second because I've in my research of you, I've found that you are doing some study into the subject of how environmental conditions actually shape creativity. And, and I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really so thrilled that you brought this up. You know, my I, the sort of interest in um, the sort of politics of, of, 20, of mid and late 20th century Africa and how it relates to art is a side interest of mine. But my main, you know, the main thing that I've been looking into is, as you said, how environmental conditions shape creativity. Mm-hmm. And I think the the big questions that I'm I'm trying to answer are basically how does you know wh- how does the natural world affect how we affect how we think creatively? How does the natural world impact and sort of what we see and how we see it? Um, how does that channel? How does that change the art forms that we're producing and the populations that I am um, doing research with and that I've been working with? Um, in over the last several years on this, on this sort of book length project that I'm at work on, uh, it, are nomadic populations. So I'm, I'm looking at how nomadic populations who are moving through and have historically moved through these sort of vast expanses of sort of, of dry grasslands and sort of sandy deserts, how that movement, how that interaction, how that sort of constant movement through a land that's very hot, that's very dry, that's very monochromatic shapes the sort of things that they're creating not only on a not only sort of on a functional level in the, in the sense that if you're moving all of the time you obviously can't your art the art that you're producing can't be these giant pieces of 80 pound sculpture mm-hmm. um, that has to be light and portable um, and it has to be something that's that's sort of worn on the body that you can carry with you mm-hmm. um, but also 
also how it how that sort of movement, as I said, through the land and looking and through everything that happens um, when you move constantly, you know, we think of about mirages and things like that that happen with travelers who travel through the desert for extended periods of time, how that translates into these sort of formal qualities of sort of the sculptures that they're producing or the textiles that they're wearing or even the sort of colors that people are attracted to. And and I think this is really a fascinating area too because I, I often think of, art that is exists outside as being you know a, a massive monument or or maybe a mural but you're really talking about something you know much more specific like fabric or like colors of the fabric what are some other examples well i think so with nomadic populations it's it's you're dealing with a lot of what we would call sort of craft or material culture so you're dealing with containers or jewelry or textiles um, but I also think, you know, the interesting thing about this topic is once you sort of start pursuing it, it, you know, any the question of how the environment shapes our creativity can be asked a, as easily about German painters in the 19th century as it can about nomadic populations mm-hmm. that live today in Africa. And if we think, you know, when I start when you start looking at it, you start thinking, oh, you're looking at these very these like deep romantic paintings that are being produced in sort of the black forests of Germany. And they have a feel to them that is very different than, say, the paintings that would be created in these pastoral landscapes at the same time um, in, you know, in Britain. And so I think you can, you can approach this from a variety of different, a variety of different subjects. I've, to relate it back to Africa, I've started looking into sort of, if you move from, if you move from sort of these nomadic areas um, of the continent, so these dry, um, very arid lands into the dense sort of Congolese river basin areas, what we would think of as sort of these rainforests, um, and looking at how the designs that people f- paint or embroider onto their textiles, which are so dense and so beautifully, imaginatively um, innovative when it comes to geometric design. I've been sort of trying to figure out, is that is there something related in those forms to just the eye's experience of not being able to like see depth that much. If you have a rainforest that's pressing in all around you, your experience of perceiving sort of vast expanses is going to be very limited. And so does that, and I don't have an answer to that yet, um, does that experience of living in these sort of rainforests actually produce the very sort of dense um, and interconnected and and, um, geometric designs that you see on textiles? Very interesting. Final question for you, Kevin Travell, because I know you're very, very busy and we, we appreciate your time. But among the interests that I, that I read about that you have is this idea of, of political efficacy and, and artworks certainly created in this kind of contemporary era. And so I, I wonder, is can art be effective with with politics? Is there a certain efficacy that art plays with regard to politics? Absolutely. I think you see that. Um, you see that certainly in Africa, but I think you see that everywhere. I think what art does is I think everyone, regardless of whether or not they think of themselves as an art person, um, and I think responds visually to what we see, we know instinctively sort of what, what delights us, what brings us joy, what horrifies us, what sort of repulses us. And I think those, those emotive qualities are exactly what politicians and people who are trying to enact change want to be doing you know i think when you think about social change you you social change happens when people stand up and say that we want this to happen or no this is wrong or there's a you sort of break out of your everyday sort of experience and complacency in the world or or acceptance about what's going on and i think art and visual creativity because it pro- can provoke those strong emotions that have done well and sort of used provocatively um, certainly has has an in, in, intimate role to play um, in politics and social change. And I think you see that not only in the contemporary period, but I think you see that sort of throughout the history of African creativity. It's sort of what attracted me most to the hist- to African art, which is the fact that art works, art lives, art does something in society, whether it's a, a sculpture that was produced a thousand years ago or something that was just produced in the 1970s. 
what a great conversation and, and what a great presentation coming up at Smithsonian Associates. I really could talk to you for for quite a while, Kevin Travella, but I know you're very busy and we certainly appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today. No, thank you so much for having me, Paul. This was a real treat. Thank you. My thanks to our guest today, Kevin Tervilla, who will be at the Smithsonian Associates Program presenting African Art and the Struggle for Independence, April 9th, 2018, at the Ripley Center in Washington, D.C. My thanks as well to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support our interviews. As usual, we'll post links to everything, and also as usual, my thanks to you, the listeners, for joining me today. Your time is valuable, and I'm grateful you're spending some of it with me. I'm always interested in feedback, and you can leave that at iTunes, Google Play, or send me email at info at notold-better.com. Stay tuned for our next show, another great one as we talk about better. The Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and remember to check out genealogybank.com slash N-O-B-S for great genealogy newspaper articles, history, and data, and to support the show. That's genealogybank.com slash N-O-B-S. Thank you.